Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from Surprise, Arizona, The Law and the Covenant, with Sasha Bolotnikoff. Well, good evening and welcome to Surprise, Arizona. And I tell you, this is a beautiful place. We've had a wonderful few days here setting up, and uh, the weather's great here. You came from Illinois today. And how was the weather there? It was, when I left, it was 14 degrees. I'm told it is down to three now. Wow. And um, heading south. Yes, right. <laughs> I was wondering, does anyone here have a bedroom they want to rent out the rest of the winter? Uh, well, we love Illinois, and, and it'll warm back up. So That's one later. good thing yeah. about, about our weather there in West Frankfurt. But we do envy you folks that get to spend the winter here. I wouldn't want to spend the summers here. Last time I was here in the summer, 125 degrees. And my, I was wearing contact lenses in those days. They stuck to my eyeballs, and I couldn't get them off. I'm serious. <laughs> it was that warm. But, uh, boy, it's been some really beautiful weather here today. And this is a great place, Jim, to begin our Anchors series for 2015. It really is. This Anchors, Jim, is the 151st Anchors. We've done 150. Isn't this makes amazing? 151. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. We, uh, I, I can't. It's, it's hard to fathom that that many uh, have actually been, been done, but it's amazing. You isn't? remember the first one? Uh, matter of fact, I don't. February 2011, yeah. Ty Gibson. Who was it? Ty Gibson. All right. And we've had Ty back several times. Several times. Several times. That's, that is true. Yeah. Well, this is uh, uh, about the Jewish work. And, you know, the amazing thing is that the servant of the Lord tells us that just before the return of our Lord, there's going to be a mighty work among the Jewish people. We've seen it already. We have. We we've really seen have. guys like mm -hmm. Doug Batchelor. Uh, Sasha Bolitnikoff is going to be here tonight, um, Jeff Zarimsky and Alan Reinock, right. mm -hmm. uh, Alex down in Florida, Florida who can't be with us this time. Uh, but there are so many of these, White Horse Ministry, uh, Steve Walberg, Steve mm -hmm. and uh, so many of these young men grew up Jewish, found the Messiah, found it in the context of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. And all of a sudden, I, I had one, one young Jewish man tell me, I now feel complete. Now, this is a brilliant young man, and he was an Orthodox Jew. But when he found this message, he said, this puts it all together. This puts it all together. He said, the Seventh-day Adventist message is the apostolic message of the, of the disciples who were Jews who kept the Sabbath and who believed in the entire Bible. And he said, this is what Seventh-day Adventists are. Now, I want to read you a statement. This comes from Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Ellen White says, God expects his messengers to take particular interest in the Jewish people. Then she says in uh, this uh, MR, I can't remember, ministry of uh, 1 MR 137 verse 2, and I want you, you've heard this statement many times, but you did not realize it was tied to the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. It says, the time has come when the Jews are to be given light. The Lord wants us to encourage and sustain men who shall labor in the right lines for this people. For there are to be a multitude convinced of the truth who will take their position for God. The time is coming when there will be as many, now listen to this, as many converted in a day as there were on the day of Pentecost. It's talking about Jews. See, we always have just applied that to a number around the world. No, she says there will be as many Jews converted in a day as there were on the day of Pentecost after the disciples had received the Holy Spirit. You know something? We want to be a part of that. And so this is why that we have invited Ralph Ringer, uh, who is the 
coordinator and director of the Jewish Outreach Ministries for North America, among other hats that he wears. And um, we have invited him to come and to be with us to introduce to us three other young men who are going to be presenting the message as Jewish believers in Jesus and the third angel's message. So I'm looking forward to this. We had, a year ago, we had a similar series with uh, several of the same people, and it was unbelievably received. And so we have invited them uh, to come and to present a series again. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. And, and it, one of the things we're trying to do is to sensitize you to the understanding that the work among particular peoples is not always as easy as it is among others. Yet God said that this work will be successful. And so we can move forward in the strength of the Lord, not our own strength. When you are dealing with people of the Islamic faith, you have to be very easy and very sensitive. When you're dealing with people of the Jewish faith, you've got to be very easy and very sensitive. You can't really sort of go in like a bull in a china shop. Yet there are ways to minister to our Jewish brethren. And one of the things we want to do during this series is sensitize the Christian community to those ways so that your evangelism or your, your uh, dealing with them can be successful and be salvific. And we're looking to, to present the right balance in understanding uh, the Jews and where they fit in to these last days. There are some that go, uh, some of our great evangelical friends that go far to the extreme in that position. However, there are some uh, that have uh, gone the extreme in the other direction of not believing that the message should go to the Jewish people at all. We believe God has a right way to present that message. And that's what we're going to be talking about in these next few days. I want to invite Pastor Merle Tull to come. And uh, Pastor Tull, thank you for allowing us to come here to this beautiful church. And we're glad you're here, Jim. And we're so happy to be with your people there. They've been so warm and hospitable. And we just, uh, you know, I think when I... I mentioned uh, that we were going to be here. I called this place, uh, what did I call it? Sunshine. sunshine. Well, it is sunshine. It's a surprise, all right. But there's a lot of good sunshine. And it's not just outside. We see it on the faces yes. of these folks here. Would you lead us in prayer? Absolutely. Shall we pray? Loving Father, you are our anchor. You are our truth. And... We want to live for you. We thank you so much for our friends that are here. Elder Gilly, be with him as he presents uh, this weekend in truth. Be with our Jewish friends in Israel, in New York, in Florida, and here in Phoenix. The Phoenix area have many Jewish people, and we pray that they will be reached by your Holy Spirit tonight. Again, Touch each one of our hearts and call, draw us nearer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We received a call on Sunday from David Barron, and he let me know that just a few minutes before, my very good friend and his father, Pastor Henry Barron, went to sleep in Jesus. 140 p.m. on Sunday. Pastor Barron and uh, I have a long history together, back to my teenage years when he was our youth pastor. Later, he joined me in Arlington, Texas for five years. He, uh, he volunteered. He was paid, but he, became, he said, I want to be your associate pastor. He was an evangelist at the time. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, I'm not. He came and he kept me in line for five years. And I, I tell you, the Lord blessed our ministry together. That, that church grew from under 300 to over 1,000. And we knew that it was the Lord's doing. But we also knew that Henry's constant visiting, his working with people, was a key in bringing people to Jesus. Henry was a wonderful singer. I'll never forget the first time I heard him sing. And he loved hymns. 
And one of those hymns that he loved so much is My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. I'm going to ask C.A. if he'll sing that song at this time. My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. I need no other evidence. I need no other it is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He will not cast me out. I need no other evidence. I need no other that Jesus died and rose again for me. The great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. My faith is resting on his word, the living word of God. Salvation in my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. And I need no other evidence, I need no that Jesus died and rose again for me. Amen. Thank you so much, C.A. I'm going to introduce to you right now Ralph Ringer, pastor and elder and Dr. Ralph Ringer, who is the director of NAD Jewish Ministries. I just gave you a doctorate. I don't know. You may have one. That. You probably have one already. I've given you another one. And so does Dr. Uh, Sasha Belitnikov. I know he has one. Yes. So I'm going to let you introduce him. All right. It's my privilege to be here and to introduce to you uh, Dr. Alexander Bolutnikov, and he's more commonly known as Sasha. He's the director of the Shalom Learning Center for the North American Division. I'm very glad to be here this evening, and uh, I hope the topic of the covenant 
will be of interest to those who are here and to our viewers. And um, that's the topic we're going to be covering every night. And uh, I'll be covering the first night, covenant, the covenant and the law. And on Sabbath morning, I will be speaking about the covenant and the atonement. So today is the topic of the law, which is a challenging one. What do we believe about the law? How do we relate the law to the new covenant? Well, <clears throat> let me see. I'm going to ask you four questions and uh, see if you believe this. How many of you believe that God gave the laws to ancient Israelites as the venue for them to be saved under the old covenant, whereas under the new covenant, Christians are saved by grace? How many of you believe it? Can I see your hands? Okay. All right. I'm not giving any reaction. Let's see the second one. If you believe this, God gave ten commandments to all people, whereas the rest of the laws of the Torah are merely ceremonial and were given to Jews only. I see some of you think this way. All right, I'm not giving you my reaction. I'm just, I'm just testing the opinions. That's just a poll, don't worry. Just a poll. Okay, the third question. Bible does not separate Ten Commandments from the rest of the laws of the Torah. Therefore, under the New Covenant, Christians are liable to keep all the laws. How many of you believe that? Okay, a little bit scared of my questions. <laughs> Very hard theology, isn't it? Okay, and the fourth one. God made the new covenant in order to nullify the laws of the old covenant. Therefore, Christians are not bound by any of the Torah laws. And so... You can find all what you need to do solely in the New Testament. Do you believe that? That one you definitely don't. <laughs> I see that. I should ask how many of you do not instead of how many of you do. But it doesn't matter. These are serious questions. These are different ways Many Christians look at the law and look at the relations, at the relationship between the old and the new covenant. You know, it is interesting how in Middle Ages, Jews were forced to convert to Christianity under the threat of execution. In fact, in Spain, during the famous Reconquista, the Reconquest, Spain was taken uh, by Christians from the uh, Arabs in, uh, at the end of 1400. And um, Jews were very much persecuted by Christians. Jews had three options. Option number one, convert to Christianity. Option number two, live within the three days, leave the country. Option number three, if option number two and number one is not met, they'll be killed. So that's, that's why it's not very easy. You know, some people say, oh, how come Jews are not accepting such a simple prophecies of the Bible? Well, 
history made it not so simple. You know? Anyway, for the Jews who accepted Christianity, they had to swear to the bishop uh, that they completely reject the laws of the Torah. How did they do this? In most of the cases, they, make them, they made them eat pork publicly to prove that they no longer feel bound by the evil laws of the Old Testament. And so, uh, they later were called maranos. Those of you who know Spanish probably aware that marana is a pig. You know, many of them immigrated to South America, and uh, we meet many of them who are still secretly in many generations keep Jewish traditions because they remember how they were forced to Christianity through eating pork. Well, so this is why the questions are not uh, uh, easy. So we'll address them one by one. So the first one, and I know some of you hesitated, because it's a very typical thinking that Old Testament temple rituals were given to Jewish people so that they, by performing them, they would be saved. And so, under the new covenant, God had relieved his people from this kind of burden, uh, burdensome process of salvation. So let's check this theory. Let's open Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4. And hear what it says. It's talking about the one of the offerings. It is called the burnt offerings. And so, right at the beginning of the offering ritual, uh, there were lots of things you will see. When a, an Israelite brings animal to the temple, the first action is described like this. He shall put his hand <coughs> over the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. You see, right at the beginning, as soon as the individual who understands his sinfulness lays his hand, by laying the hand, he basically transfers this, his sin upon the animal, as soon as it's done, there is an atonement. Afterwards, the animal dies. That's what the wages of sin is. Afterwards, the priests do all kinds of uh, manipulations with blood and with other parts of the animal. But all of this does not really concern the fact that the relationship between this Israelite and God are fixed as long as as he unloaded himself from the sin he had and put the sin upon the animal that acts as a substitute. So it's exactly the same how we're saved today, right? How is Jesus gives, given us justification? Does he tell us, oh, you need to do this, you need to do this, and this, you got to have a checklist like the airplane pilot. And at the end of the checklist, boom, justification. Not really. We acknowledge ourselves as sinners. We claim the blood of Jesus to atone for our sins, and we're justified. 
And then we follow the same way as the ritual follows because our life changes, we change our habits, whatever we need to change, but justification comes right at the beginning at no cost. As long as we claim the blood of the Messiah to be applied for our atonement. When Israelites did not understand this concept, because it wasn't easy to understand, and I'll explain you why. See, pagans also brought many sacrifices in their temples. And, but they did it for a sole purpose of feeding their deities. That, that's, that's, the, that's the difference. In other words, pagans, by bringing offerings to the temples, were paying deity for the things this deity was doing. So if there was a temple of Baal, who was a god of uh, fertility, so they bring sacrifices, and they expect that Baal will receive X amount of bulls and goats, and for this, the rain will come. So it's kind of transaction type of payment relation. And when Israelites got this attitude in the book of Isaiah, I, uh, uh, the prophet speaks, uh, bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbath, look, even new moons and Sabbath and the calling of the assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and, sac and sacred meetings. You see, God did not need the sacrificial animals to, as a payment for justification and atonement. God needed a change heart. And that's exactly where Isaiah goes. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Put away your evil doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Then come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sin are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1, I was reading from the verse 13 through 18. This is not new concept in the new covenant. This is exactly what God expected from Israel. Change of heart. And then the change of heart, conversion of the heart, or even he used the term circumcision of the heart, brings atonement. Then God says, if your sins are, uh, are red as crimson, I'll make them as white as snow. Exactly the same thing as we have under the new covenant. The difference is Israelites, by offering their, their, their sacrifices, looked forward for the, to the ultimate Lamb of God that would take care of all the problems. And we, under the new covenant, look back at the Calvary where our justification is done once and for all all and for everybody who wants to change the heart. So, first question we kind of dealt with. Let's look at the second question. And this is a tough one. Are all the laws outside the Decalogue ceremonial? Well, that's a question which often is misunderstood. 
people often put two boxes. They take the Ten Commandments and the rest is just a ceremonial. And I can tell you why. Because there was lots of discussion, especially in the 19th century, between different Sabbath-keeping Christian groups and traditional Protestants. And so the traditional Protestants were bringing all kinds of texts. And I will show you one text, which you're probably f very familiar with. And so the Protestants of the 19th century tried to find the, the way to defend Sabbath. And so when they started doing it, they said, oh, we're just keeping Ten Commandments. The rest is only for the Jews. Well... How about the laws of Leviticus 11? Clean and unclean food. They're not part of Ten Commandments. How about the laws of Numbers chapter 18 and uh, Leviticus chapter 27 where it talks about returning our tithe to the Lord? That's not part of a Decalogue. How about this? Let me keep reading. How about this? Because uh, sometimes the argument is we don't need the old covenant laws because New Testament teaches us everything. So, Leviticus 19, 31 and 32. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not speak after them. Do not be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. You know the position of the Torah against all kinds of uh, spiritism. There is no mention of this in the New Testament. You got to take it from the Torah. How about this? It's a little bit, the language is a little bit culturally conditioned, but you understand the essence here. You shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of old men and fear your, the Lord your God. Verse 32. Under the new covenant, we are not supposed to respect our... Uh, uh, seniors, you know. So this is something. Uh, for example, let's go one other law, and you will see why people often do not understand these laws because they are written in the language of the culture which existed 3,000 years ago. But I think we can relate to this. Look at this, Leviticus 19.10. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for poor and to the stranger. That was actually in ancient Israel a safety net. In other words, remember Ruth? When they came and they had nothing, based on the laws of the Torah, Ruth went to glean at the edges of Boaz's field. You know what happened after that. She became a grandmother of King David, who is the direct ancestor of our Lord Jesus. You see, so is this applicable today? Well, if we change the language, you know, maybe not everyone uh, has the vineyard or field. The farming is kind of uh, no longer popular on individual levels, right? But what about uh, taking uh, extra uh, content of uh, our closets, uh, which we don't wear, to help uh, who really needs that? You see, Jews would say this is a mitzvah. And when Jews say it's mitzvah, 
I, I'm, I have a hard time translating it as a commandment because sometimes in our, in the Christian culture, commandment is, oh, you got to do it, otherwise you'll be lost. It's not about being lost. It's about being a human being in the image of God. And that's when God says, this is, when Jews says, this is a mitzvah, this is how we build relation. This is how we love our neighbor. You know, when we try to help the poor, protect the widow. And that's what Torah is talking uh, about. Well, how about this? Somebody says, this is only ceremonial and only to the Jews. Some sensitive subject, touchy. Leviticus 18.19. Do not approach a wife to have intimate relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. It's only for the Jews, right? Jewish women are built this way, right? You see the logic that the Old Testament laws are ceremonial and only to the, given to the Jews just doesn't add up. It's, it's good when you are from the distance, never read uh, the Torah, just reading uh, the epistles of Paul and hearing the debate, but when you start reading, you will see how it just doesn't work. It just won't work. You got to, that's why Psalm says, Psalm 1, verse uh, 2, it says, but in the law of the Lord, he meditates day and night. There is a lot to meditate about this because the laws of the Torah actually provide a great guidance for our ethics. That's where we can draw our ethics. Well, so, how about this? Also Leviticus. And it seems like, oh, Levitical law, it's all about sacrifices, you know. We start reading this, it seems like you're in a butcher shop. And you close the book of Leviticus frustrated, and you say, I don't want this, you know. If I keep reading it too much, uh, you know, I will become cruel to the animals. Well, again, this is a different culture. God speaks the language of shepherd, but the message is for us. How about this? Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Is it ceremonial? Kind of a ritual of loving neighbor. We like that, huh? So, have we heard it somewhere else? Love your neighbor as yourself? Oh, if you look at the book of Matthew, chapter 22, there is a very interesting conversation between Jesus and one Pharisee. Who, and the Pharisee asks him, what is the great, what is the, which is the great commandment in the Torah? And Jesus answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. By the way, is Jesus just invented the new commandment in place of the Ten Commandment? It's interesting. I had a good friend who watched one of my presentations in uh, Russian language on the book of Revelation, and there... I just had an animation of the heavenly sanctuary, and I was uh, going, explaining Revelation 11, 19, when the temple of, uh, of God was open in heaven, 
and the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, became visible. And in this animation, the top of the Ark opens up and you have uh, two tablets with Ten Commandments coming out with the light. So this uh, gentleman called me. I like your presentation, but I was shocked. I asked him, what was shocking you, uh, Michael? And he told me, your Ark of the Covenant inside has tablets with Ten Commandments. I said, what does it have supposed to be? What is it supposed to have in heaven? Oh, doesn't Jesus replace two, uh, uh, Ten Commandments with two? Well, if you read carefully, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is nothing new that Jesus uh, presents. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Check it out. He's quoting straight from the Torah as well as the second one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophet. You see, we often do not understand the structure of the laws in the Bible, and we get lost. Let me explain to you with these terms. I get my civic exam to get my U.S. citizenship back uh, five years ago, so, of course, there was a question. What are the foundational principles of uh, the American Constitution? And there are foundational principles. Li life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So think of what Jesus just taught this Pharisee as the same example. These are the foundational principles of heavenly constitution. Well, U.S. Constitution is not does not consist of three words. It consists of a number of articles. So the heavenly constitution consists of ten articles. So you have love your, <coughs> love your God and love your neighbor as life, liberty, you know, you got three in the American Constitution, two in heavenly. And then you have ten articles of heavenly Constitution that, uh, that uh, are sprouting from these two foundational principles. But does the court in a regular state uh, or county or city uh, operate solely on constitution? That is not possible. Congress makes laws and the uh, judicial branch in, upholds this law and judges by these laws. And of course, it's important to see that these laws would expand on a constitution and not contradict the Constitution. So that's what you have in the Torah, exactly the same uh, pr legal process. So you have foundational principles, then you have the Constitution, and then you have ethical applications for this Constitution. Well, the biggest problem comes when we look at this from the New Testament perspective without even having slightest idea what the Old Testament says. And this is why we run into this problem in Colossians 2.14, which says in King James Bible, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Well, 
This was a big, big uh, issue back in the 19th century. What was nailed to the cross? The problem is that you have apparent uh, inconsistency here. Look at Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So, you can't say that handwriting of ordinances is something against us, and God nailed it to the cross, and Ten Commandments are good. Because what was the psalmist David doing? I mean, does Bible contradict itself? One of the big problems is uh, when we look at this and, f uh, and taking from context uh, the, 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 the passage from Deuteronomy, uh, which uh, says in verse, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 31, verse 26, that the book of the law is besides the Ark of the Covenant, and it is against you. The question is, what is the book of the law? If I was to take you to one of our uh, congregations, Adventist Jewish congregation. Most of them have actually the scrolls of the Torah. And I will open it up, and there will be Ten Commandments in it. So, believe me, that book which Moses finished, the Pentateuch, did not have a torn page. It wasn't like you go until Exodus 19 there, and there would be a note here, go inside the ark to read the contents of Exodus 20, <laughs> then there is a stitch and everything goes, and this is going to be against you where the Ten Commandments are for you. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. What is the problem? You know, the problem is that when we look at the Old Testament, we never see the law called handwriting. And the current research and the new translations, especially New American Standard Bible, uh, translate this text totally different. I am reading New American Standard Bible. Having canceled out the certificate of death, consist in the decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. If you look at most modern translation, I'm not going to, I don't have time to describe to you how the modern scholarship discovered the, the meaning of this Greek term, hierographon dogma sin. I would, even, I would only say this, that in, in Greek of the first century, in Roman uh, court language, dogma was the accusation that was actually nailed to the cross above the head of the criminal uh, so that people would know what he is accused of. Jesus had dogma above his hand, is his head. That dogma stated, King of the Jews. And we have dogma over our head. Each of us knows what do we owe and what is our debt. And God knows, and he offers the solution to nail it to the cross once and for all. Well, the question is, now, 
can we really keep all 613 commandments of the Torah? Well, not so simple. How about this? Leviticus 24, 16. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. Okay. Let us turn into some Saudi Arabia. Right? Or especially in the setting of the church. Yeah? Somebody comes and says something against God. Do you have in your church some storage for stones? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a question. That's a question. And here is the reason why. This is the answer that is provided to us by Paul. When Paul talks and describes the relations between the old and the new covenants, Hebrew chapter 8, verse 13 says, In that he says, a new covenant, he had made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete is growing old and ready to vanish away. Oh, people say, great. Now we, that's the proof that we don't need all the laws. The big problem often in our Bibles that they place chapter division and verse division artificially, you know. Got to read a little further. And the next chapter describes what the Old Covenant is all about. And it says, Indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service in the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. And it says next, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regards to consciousness, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. So that's what the Old Covenant, by the definition of Paul, clearly presented <coughs> in the epistle to Hebrews. The Old Covenant is not the law. It is a sanctuary service. And anything pertaining to it. Because we have a perfect sanctuary and a perfect high priest. You know, there are so many people today who are obsessed about the restoration of the temple. And uh, to be honest, I was very surprised. Being Jewish, I was very surprised that Christians are worried about the restoration of temple in Jerusalem. And uh, I was listening to all of the uh, presentations and, all of, and reading all of the books, and I realized how many Christians just don't understand what is happening in Jewish circles. I will give you one of the difficulties in restoration of the temple is finding a high priest. They don't know who should be the high priest. I mean, yes, you can, you can have some descendants of the tribes of Levi. And especially, uh, I have my good friend, he gave his testimony, Rushel Aronov. And he's from the, definitely, uh, he's uh, from a priestly lineage. Is he supposed to become a high priest? There are tens of thousands, uh, of thousands like him. 
Whom do they choose? I'm so glad I don't have to worry. I have my high priest, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew, who is in heavenly sanctuary performing the priestly service for me and for you. And this is why I'm not worried about the temple in Jerusalem. I am more worried that my brother's Jews would understand who is their high priest today. And I am worried that everybody else would understand who is the high priest today, who bore our iniquity, who died for us on Calvary, and now he is representing us in heaven. That is the greatest sense of security. That is the new covenant. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to understand the value of your covenant. Help us to understand the sacrifice you have made and understand what you are doing for us right now in heaven, being our high priest, not human, sinful, but sinless and divine. Help us to anchor our hope inside the veil where you are our advocate and representative. Thank you, Lord, for this. Amen.